right, we're talking about uh, revisiting old Baptist hobby horses is what this little series is called. I just thought it would be helpful and beneficial to go through just things that I grew up hearing and pro anybody that was in an independent fundamental Baptist church probably grew up hearing and of, of late, well, kind of in the last decade or whatever, you just don't hear certain things as much. They're not as popular to preach. Uh, you know, people get offended by it and they stop coming to church or whatever. And sometimes that's why they stop preaching them. And so the idea is to revisit these things and number one, uh, find out, is it something that we should still be preaching? And so far, they're all things that we should be preaching, but uh, maybe got to be careful how we do it and not to get so hung up that these things become, again, a hobby horse, just simply what I mean by that is it's something that they always preach about. Look, there are certain things that Jesus always preached about, so it's not wrong that something would come up a whole lot. It depends on the issue, different churches. You know, you go to one church, you're like, man, they're always preaching on this thing. Well, it could be that that pastor knows that this is what the people need to hear, or it could be that he's not even thinking about it. I know there's been times where I keep hitting on something. I don't know why. I feel like the Lord's leading it on my heart, and I keep on, I'm like, I don't think anybody in here needs that. And then out of the blue, somebody come to me and say, that's really a huge blessing in my life. I needed that. I'm struggling in that area or something. Had no idea, but it's just something that uh, you got to just let the Holy Spirit kind of work as, as the Bible is preached to you. And look, there are a lot of things that uh, are not popular nowadays to be able to uh, preach about. And we don't obviously judge what we're going to preach based on how popular it is. That, either way, either way. I'm not going to preach uh, a sermon, necessarily look for sermons that are going to be popular in this group. Right? That wouldn't be helpful to anybody. You say, oh man, he gets up there every week and he preaches really hard on this and that and that. Well, yeah, if I'm getting a bunch of amens, but it's not really helping anybody, it's not doing us any good. <laughs> right? I could preach on the Sodomites every service and uh, praise the Lord, uh, it needs to be preached on in our society right now. But it probably won't help anybody in this room because I don't think anybody's dealing with that, <laughs> that issue right now. Okay, Maybe your relationship and how to deal with those out in the world or whatever. Uh, and we certainly bring those up whenever the Lord allows. Well, tonight, what I want to preach about is smoking. And you might say, uh, depending on how you grew up, you might say it's a non-issue, who cares, it's not an important thing. Or you might even think it's not that, that many people do that because, you know, smoking is not as popular nowadays as it was in the 50s, 60s. I was surprised. Uh, we like sometimes watching old uh, uh, sitcoms or something like that, black and white. And uh, I was surprised in my adult years to go back and see some things where that were popular in the culture in those days uh, some things will kind of shock you because you don't really think that they you know that was an issue back then and one thing I notice is that smoking everybody I mean it doesn't matter if you watch Andy Griffith or Dick Van Dyke or whatever when they got leisure time they pop out a cigarette and they're smoking and it's like whoa nowadays they don't even show that on TV uh, you go to a restaurant nowadays they're not gonna let you smoke most likely. I think there might be some that still grandfather in, like you could go and do that. But most places, you can't smoke in public public places. Uh, well, there was a time when everybody did. They had ashtrays everywhere. Even whenever I was growing up as a little kid, uh, public places, there was a lot of smoking. It might seem like it's not even that big deal anymore, but you know what? I know a lot of people, even good Christian folk, who, who have been affected by uh, this addiction of, uh, of smoking, tobacco, some kind of a substance like that that they use. And I'm telling you, I, uh, uh, I just started, I'm working on a, a class uh, for Iola right now, but one, one day, Lord willing, we'll be able to put some people through, through it in Kansas City as well. But the class is pretty much, I mean, it's evangelistic in the sense that obviously that's the only place anybody's going to find hope. But the other idea is just to help people. This is like going through some situations that people you know, it's destroying their life and they need some basic help uh, on certain situations. Of course, first want to lead them to Jesus and show them that he's the only hope of any, anything in their life. But, uh, but then to begin to work just little things one at a time. And, and uh, one of the things uh, that I expect is going to be a lot of addictions. And I've talked to people who have been addicted to meth and, and all kinds of drugs, alcohol and stuff like that. And I've had many of them tell me, but the hardest one to give up is cigarettes or tobacco, uh, chewing, you know, sometimes chewing tobacco is even more addictive, I've been told, than smoking it. I don't know. I've never uh, been involved in that. When I was about seven, eight years old, don't remember the exact age, but I remember uh, in my school, 
elementary school, going to a gymnasium and having a big conversation. Maybe you've been through those in your school, I don't know. And they came and they took a cigarette and they puffed it into this little contraption. And, uh, and then they, uh, they showed you what, it, what the inside looked like before and it was just white as can be. And when they opened it up, it's all just nasty colored and, and that smoke just left all the nicotine and all the chemicals in there, uh, just left this. And I remember as a kid thinking, oh, it's doing that to my, it would do that to my lungs if I smoked. And I remember making a pledge right there that I'm never going to smoke. Praise the Lord, I never did. Never had any interest in it. Never had any desire to it. In fact, growing up, I just looked at that and thought that was one of the most disgusting things anybody can do. And so the, I passed that on to my kids, not on purpose, but just listening, you know, uh, my wife and I driving in the car, you know, and you stop at, a, at a, a red light and the person next to you is smoking and it's coming in the car. And you're just like, ugh, roll the window up. So disgusting. And the kids grow up. That's all they hear about. And so they're thinking, oh, that's a nasty thing. In fact, I don't know if you know this or not, but <clears throat> there's a story that Zachary often tells about how the Lord used that. Uh, to even uh, introduce the gospel to him. As a very young kid, that exact same thing happened. We pulled up, car next to us, somebody was smoking. And so he rolled up his window and he looked at me and said, Dad, you know, I don't ever want to be a sinner like that. And so I had to show him, hey, you are a sinner. <laughs> just because you're not smoking doesn't mean you're not a sinner. And just because you're a little kid doesn't mean you're not a sinner. And so we went through that about everybody's a sinner. We all deserve to go to hell. And what the Lord was able to use that to uh, preach the gospel to him. But I realized at that point that my kids, because we didn't smoke, it was real easy for them to look at other people and be like, oh, that's the most disgusting thing they can do and how sinful and all that kind of stuff. Well, there was a day where I felt a little stronger against smoking than I am now. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, before I get too apologetic, look, smoking is a nasty habit. Okay, it's a nasty habit. It makes your clothes stink, right? We've been visiting family members, and I'm not, this is not me trying to be ugly or, or anything. You know, this is just reality. This is truth. We've visited family members that we knew smoked, and we've said we're going to leave our suitcases in the car and just take in only the clothes that we're wearing because we don't want all of our clothes in that suitcase to smell. Uh, and sometimes you talk to these people, and they're like, oh, duh, uh, you, you can't smell anything, can you? And you're like, no, if you smoke, everybody can smell it. Everybody can know. Uh, the timing of this sermon is is really interesting because this is something I've been plan on, planning on preaching for a little while. I just found out uh, a couple days ago that a guy that was a friend of our church, used to be a member of our church for a long time, hasn't been there in a couple years now, um, but he still called me quite a bit and everything. But uh, it's, a, it's a sad situation. I don't want to spend too much time on that. But basically, he was a Vietnam vet and, uh, and has still had P, uh, PTSD and had a lot of struggles with some of the things he saw. He was in the special forces and saw some crazy things and saw a lot of death and a lot of friends of his went in POWs and missing action and uh, MIA. And so uh, he was uh, uh, anyway, always thinking about those things. And he didn't talk about those things, but he would tell the shrink, I mean, the, the, uh, the psychiatrist, he called her the, nut, the nutcracker. And he would go and he would see her and she would try to get into his head and he would talk about these things. But he was always depressed, always down, always struggling with different things. And so one of the things he had turned to, and of course, a lot of people in the military, uh, cigarettes, alcohol, I mean, anything to kind of take their mind off of some things. And this was him. And the psychiatrist even told him, hey, if it helps to calm your nerves, if it helps get your mind off of that, go ahead and do it. OK, and so this is like this is the philosophy of anyone in the medical field. It seems like nowadays, hey, just take the, whatever substance. Yeah, it might harm you down the road, but right now it's going to make you feel better and <laughs> give you these substances. And so this was his idea. And uh, I mean, this is, was the idea that he would just smoke and smoke and smoke and smoke. And man, he smelled bad. I love I love the guy, but he smelled bad. And when he walked into the church, the whole church knew that Paul was there. And uh, and anyway, it was a, it was a it was a terrible thing. Uh, fortunately, he was he was he lived alone, didn't have a lot of people that he knew, and and uh, he would call every once in a while. I would check on him and, and talk with him a little bit. And and the sad thing is, just the other day, uh, somebody found him. He had been dead for like ten days in, in his house, and nobody knew until uh, you know uh, there was uh, some evidence, and so people went and checked on him. 
And all I know is that his heart stopped. But I'm telling you, it wasn't a surprise because he smoked so much that we knew he was going to die. I've had family members who died of cancer because they smoked, lung cancer. Now, sometimes they live a pretty old life, but man, the last 20 years of their life is miserable because they've been smoking. Smoking stains everything. This is why public places don't allow it anymore and why you have to pay more uh, for smoking. If I understand right, you have to pay more for smoking if you go into a hotel or something like that because they know it's going to damage things. You know, there's going to be holes in the carpet from the from the ashes, and there's going to be... Uh, uh, I used to clean for a living, and I'll tell you, I'd go into some of these apartments to clean, and you could spray a little cleaner on the wall and take a rag and go like this, and this would be yellow or brown or whatever because all that nicotine. Imagine what it's doing to your lungs, right? And so, uh, uh, you know, we all know that it causes cancer. That's why you read, I mean, right on the packages, it says Surgeon General's warning. If there's any advertisement anywhere, Surgeon General warning, uh, this is going to cause cancer. I mean, it doesn't even tell you like it might, you know, just possibly. It's almost like don't take it if you got kids and, the, and all these kinds of things. Because, uh, I mean, if you have a, 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 if, if a woman is pregnant, not supposed to take it because... They know it's going to cause all kinds of health problems. It limits your ability to work and exercise. You've all probably met somebody that huffs and puffs, right? Just whenever they climb stairs or go across the, because, uh, because it affects their lungs and it gives them asthma and all that. Not only that, I remember working in different places that I worked. They would be uh, like every five, ten minutes, it seemed like somebody had to go take a smoke break. And as a non-smoker, it was kind of like, what in the world are these people taking all these breaks for? <laughs> Everybody, if you don't smoke, you know, you don't get five, every five minutes you get a coffee break. Now, come on, that's going to be a different story. <laughs> but uh, they're smoking and it's just, it really becomes a problem. And I don't apologize for preaching against it. I think it's a, a, a bad habit and it's a, it's a bad thing. It's not important what I think about it, though. It's important what the Bible uh, says about these things. Now, incidentally, in case you didn't know, there's nothing in the Bible that talks about smoking. <laughs> because it's not really something that was practiced back then. And so we're going to have to pre uh, uh, preach on the idea of it, uh, but not necessarily uh, not the specific act of smoking. But growing up, like I said, it was always a problem. It got to the point where I uh, was pretty strict about it in, in, in my own thinking. And uh, I remember becoming the pastor, and if somebody... Uh, smoked and they were anywhere on the property, I felt like they were just like damaging our, our testimony in the community or something like that. Because I grew up and the big joke in independent fundamental Baptist churches were that the, the Southern Baptists were the ones that smoked. <laughs> the deacons in the Southern Baptist churches, they all smoke and everything. But look, I've changed a little bit on that. Still think it's a bad habit. Still think it's something that uh, nobody should do. And I'm going to preach about uh, 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 why I say that. But at the same time, I don't put it in the same category as fornication or stealing or adultery or something like that, okay? Uh, I will tell you why I think it's wrong and why, why we shouldn't do it. Uh, but look, there's a lot of things that we do that are bad for our bodies. There's a lot of things we do that affect other people and all that. And, we, and, the, and the bottom line is tobacco is just one of those, <laughs> okay? Uh, it's real easy for Christians who've never dealt with that, never been addicted to that, to just go say, man, that's the nastiest, filthiest thing you could ever do. Well, it's easy for you to say, but they could turn around and look at something that you're doing and say, hey, that's the nastiest thing a, a Christian could ever do. And so I'm not preaching this to just go condemn everybody and let's criticize them, put them down and, and talk about how worthless they are. We don't know the reason that people have gotten addicted to, uh, to uh, cigarettes, but... I don't think it's something that we should just stop preaching about. Uh, we should preach it in a, uh, in a biblical sense. But the issue is not new. I don't see it anywhere in the King James Bible because the King James Bible, of course, is, talk, is, a, is a translation of events that happened long before the 1600s, right? But in the 1600s, the king that authorized the King James Version was King James I. How many of you guys have ever read what he thought about the use of tobacco? <laughs> Could you pass these out for me, brother? I don't care. There's enough for everybody. So if, if they can read, they can. I want to take you through this. It's too long. It's like uh, eight pages. This is four front and back here. Uh, an article that he wrote. I don't know who he was addressing exactly. Addressing just England. and Now, look, 
Just because we're a King James only church, but that doesn't mean this is what I'm giving you is infallible word of God. Okay, this is King James words. This is God's words here. Okay, not not this. This is, is God's word. <laughs> but this is interesting that this is something that King James uh, felt about smoking. And he talked about that to his people. Uh, there's probably. A little bit of evidence to me as I'm reading this that maybe he's talking about like his military men, uh, you know, that what he thinks about smoking. And anyway, I, I, I want to run you through this, point out a couple areas. You can take this and read it on your own sometime. Don't get too distracted reading things. Uh, just kind of follow along with what I'm saying. But uh, it's, it's written in that kind of uh, Elizabethan uh writing okay so so there it even is a little bit confusing as you're reading it uh, of course this is typed out a little differently but i get i might get a little confused on some of the words and then have to think about the spelling and everything uh but here he starts off basically saying you know uh he's going to give a case for why smoking is bad okay and so he starts off in that first uh sentence you see here where he says uh the consideration both of the first original thereof and so he's talking about basically where are the origins of smoking where did it come from as far as the nation the the kingdom there uh, in england was concerned so he gives the origin of it and basically what he's say, saying in this first paragraph is that the indians uh you know they were using it and they were using it for medicinal purposes and somehow passed that on to the uh so many of you guys aren't listening to me because you're reading it. I know. I know how this works. Okay. <laughs> and so uh, he's talking about the origin of it. Look down at that uh, second paragraph towards the end where it says, uh, okay, so he's talking about how the, the Indians are doing this. And then he says this. He's like, look, if we don't, uh, we wouldn't follow the example of the Spaniards or the French. Why would we follow the example of the Indians? So here's what he says. Towards the end, uh, let's see, uh, about fifth line up. Shall we, I say, uh, I say without blush, blushing, abase ourselves so far as to imitate these beastly Indians? Sorry if you're, uh, uh, if you're of Indian origin <laughs> here. Slaves to the Spaniards, refuse to the world, and as yet aliens from the holy covenant of God, he's saying they're savages. They don't believe in God. They don't do, you know, why would you want to follow? Why do ye not as well imitate them in walking naked as they do? In preferring glass, feathers, and such toys to gold and precious stones as they do. Yea, why do ye not deny God and adore the devil as they do? He's saying, why would you just follow after, hey, this is cool. They're smoking uh, tobacco. Let me smoke some tobacco. They're like, why would you do that? Yeah. You know, it's pretty interesting, uh, uh, some of the arguments he's making. But then apparently there were some people that were for it and they were saying, oh, no, no, it's good for you. And uh, he so he enters into this little debate and gives some arguments as to, uh, to uh, debunk some of the things that they said about it. OK, look at uh, that second page or the back of the first page, I guess, the second page. Five paragraphs down. And go to that, that second sentence there. Again, apparently there were some people that used this argument. He says that the brains of all men being naturally cold and wet, all dry and hot things should be good for them. Of which uh, nature this stinking suffumigation is and therefore of good use to them. So the argument was since your brain is cold and moist, you need to take something that's hot and dry, right? And that'll be good for your brain. And so he makes kind of an argument that says, actually, it makes more sense that if your brain's supposed to be cold and, mo and moist, that if you're taking something hot and dry, it's gonna, it's gonna turn you in, uh, make you mad. Uh, you know what I mean? Like uh, psychological problems and everything. Now look, I don't know all the science behind it, but true enough, smoking does affect the brain and not in a positive way. It might make you feel a little bit better, but it causes all kinds of problems. And one of the things, it's interesting that he's saying this is because one of the problems that it does cause is it dehydrates people. And when it dehydrates them, then their brain's not getting the, uh, 
uh, the things that it, it's supposed to be getting, and it can cause a lot of problems in that. That's why people that smoke a lot of times, uh, you know, they're real dry. You could pinch your skin, and it'll just stay like that. You know what I mean? And uh, and their skin's real dry. Uh, a lot of times, people start looking a lot older than they are whenever they smoke, and that is interesting. That I don't know about the science behind all this, but it is interesting. This that here's what they found is good for your brain. Things like good fats, right? Which is not uh, dry and hot. <laughs> okay, good. That's, a, that, that's not important. Anyway, he d- kind of debunks this, and here's what he says. Look at your at the next page there. Uh, second line, it says, For if a man, because the brains are cold and humid, would therefore use inwardly by smells or outwardly by application things of hot and dry quality, all the gain that he would make thereof would only be to put himself in great forwardness for running mad. By overwatching himself, the coldness and moisture in our brain uh, being the only ordinary means that, uh, pur- uh, that procure our sleep and rest. So he's saying, look, hey, it's going to mess you up. It might make you feel good for a little while, but the cigarette's going to mess you up. This is just the arguments that he's making. Okay, and so uh, uh, let's see here. Then he postulates this, that the smell alone should let you know when something's poisonous. You smell it, it gives a nasty smell. You should be like, oh, man, I'm not. Now, look, there's some, you know, some people are like, oh, man, that, uh, what was the name of that cheese? (laughs) Asiago cheese or something like that. Hey, that doesn't smell like something that you should be eating, but it's good for you. Uh, Broccoli, Brussels sprouts, when they're cooked, doesn't smell like something you should be eating, but it's good for you. But anyway, he makes a good point. If you smell something and it's like, oh, that smells like poison, why would you want to eat it? Right. And so here's what he says. Uh, Let's see here. You're on the same page. One, two, third paragraph, few lines down for the nose being the proper organ and convey of the sense of smelling to the brains, uh, which are the only fountain of that sense doth ever serve us for an infallible witness, whether the odor which we smell be healthful or hurtful to the brain. Okay. (laughs) You should, your own nose should tell you that that's going to be bad for you is what he's saying. Let me just stop right there and say this about the King James. Aren't you glad? Have you ever read the preface to uh, at the beginning of the King James Bible, like the word to the readers or whatever? Aren't you glad that the King James doesn't read like that? <laughs> it's written for the common man. You can read it. It's very simple, uh, believe it or not. People talk about how hard and difficult it is. No, no, no. You read the way that they wrote, and that's difficult to read. King James, uh, it's written at the same time. But it doesn't read like that. It reads a whole lot easier. But anyway, that's just something I want to throw in, out there. All right, let's turn the page here. And so after making all these arguments about uh, and debunking these people that are, are saying all this, he, he, he talks about the absurdity that it is a preventative medicine. And this is pretty interesting because what did I say? That, that psychiatrist told my friend Paul that, hey, you know what, just take it. It'll stop you from having, you know, depression and all these kinds of things. And uh, the and, and today's medicine, you know, they say, hey, take this, you know, it'll, it'll prevent all these other problems. How many people have heard, like, take some red wine and it'll help you, uh, you know, sleep better and do all these kinds of things. And he's, he says something I really like. Like Jesus said, you know, he that is whole needs not a physician, but he, they, they that are sick, right? They that are holding it needed a physician. So that's my theory about going to the doctor. Like, why am I just going to constantly go and get their advice and their physical and get these shots and all this kind of stuff? No, the doctors are there so that whenever my body, you know, has tapped its resources and it's not working for some reason, they can. Anyway, that's another, uh, that's another story. But here's what he says there towards the end. Uh, I don't know, seven, eight lines up, maybe nine. It says, I pray in the middle of the line there, it says, I pray you what foolish boy. Oh, I like here he uses this. Uh, uh, anyway, he says, I pray you what foolish boy, what silly wench, that old uh, doting wife or ignorant co- uh, country clown is not a physician for the toothache, for the colic, in diverse such common diseases. <laughs> He's like, why, why are you going to the doc? I mean, it takes some doctor's advice about smoking and say, oh, this is good for you. Go ahead and do it, which it's not. <laughs> okay, it's clearly not. And he goes and says this, besides, he says it's likely to kill you. Look at the very last line on that page. But the contrary, if a man smoke himself to death with it, and many have done, oh, 
then some other disease must bear the blame for that fault. You know, he's, uh, he's really uh, making some decent points. They use a sarcasm. I like sarcasm, appreciate sarcasm. So the next page, uh, about three lines up from the bottom, says, oh, ominent power of tobacco. He's, all these people are claiming that it cures this and it causes this, and he's, he's uh, using some sarcasm there. Okay, next page. Sorry, I, I, I don't mean to preach King James article here, but <laughs> I'll get to the Bible in a second. But this is some uh, pretty decent stuff. Now he gets into what he says is the sinfulness of smoking. Look right there in the middle paragraph. Thus having, as I trust, sufficiently answered the most principal arguments that are used in defense of this vile custom, it rests only to inform you what sins and vanities you commit in the filthy abuse thereof. First, are you not guilty of sinful and shameful lusts? For lust must be as well in any of the senses as in feeling. And, all, and although you be troubled with no disease, but in perfect health, ye can, uh, uh, yet can ye neither be merry at an ordinary or lasciviousness in the, in the stews, if you uh, lack tobacco to provide your appetite to any of those sorts of recreation, lusting after it as the, child, uh, as the children of Israel did in the wilderness after quails. Okay, so he's saying the smoking, the constantly having to do that and lusting after that. He said that could be sin. And down there, uh, a little bit towards the bottom where it says thirdly, is his third point he makes. Uh, this is interesting, okay? This is where I'm like, what was King James saying? Okay, we got to remember the kings back then thought that they deserved all the, the, uh, uh, the praise and all that kind of stuff. This is kind of interesting. Says, thirdly, is not this the greatest sin of all? that your persons and goods for the maintenance both of the honor and safety of your king and common enabled yourselves in both. Here's what he's saying. Like, isn't that the greatest sin that you're not going to keep your king safe and your country safe? Right? That's the greatest sin. But why did he say that? Because he's saying like these people that are given to smoking, he said, they're not of any value. They're not good soldiers. They're not strong. They're not, uh, uh, they have the problem. Here's what he says in the last verse. He says, if your persons having by this continual vile custom brought you brought yourselves to this sinful, uh, sorry, shameful in, in <laughs> whatever that word is, in peculity, in pec, whatever, that you are not able to ride or walk the journey of a Jew Sabbath. By the way, the journey of a Jew Sabbath, meaning what the Jews were allowed to walk on a Sabbath day, which equals about a half a mile. Right. So kind of like walking around this property, maybe twice, uh, if that much is like 0.621 mi uh, uh, miles is how much they were allowed to walk on a Sabbath day. A Jew was. And so he's like using that as like a small distance to walk. And he's like uh, he's like that if you were able to ride, uh, not able to ride or walk the journey of a Jew Sabbath, but you must have a reeky coal brought you from the next poor house to kindle your tobacco with. Whereas you cannot be thought able for any service in the wars that cannot endure oft times the want of meat, drink, and sleep, much more that uh, then must he endure the want of tobacco, okay? So anyway, he's saying that it's got to the point where uh, the people are of little value. In fact, he says this. He says even the slaves, if they're given over to tobacco, they're not worth anything. This is what he's saying in that time. That last, uh, on that very last page, or not the very last page, but page before, top paragraph, the last sentence, in this very custom of taking tobacco, whereof our present purpose is, is even at this day accounted so effeminate among the Indians themselves as in the market, they will offer no price for a slave to be sold whom they find to be a great tobacco taker. And then he goes on in this next paragraph to say that it stinks and it causes bad breath, which he puts a little bit too much uh, in <laughs> emphasis on. But anyway, and then uh, the very last paragraph. Have you not reason then to be ashamed and to forbear this filthy novelty so basely grounded, so foolishly received, and so grossly mistaken in the right use thereof? In your abuse thereof, sinning against God, harming yourselves both in persons and goods, and raking also thereby the marks and notes of vanity upon you by the custom thereof, making yourself to be wondered at by all foreign civil nations uh, and by all strangers that come unto you to be scorned and condemned. 
a custom loathsome to the eye, hateful to the nose, harmful to the brain, dangerous to the lungs, and in the black stinking fume thereof, nearest resembling the horrible stench smoke of the pit that is bottomless. <laughs> he didn't like smoking very much, all right? Or tobacco use, I should say. I don't know exactly how it was taken in, but obviously through smoke, inhaling smoke of some sort. Which brings to question, you know, logic should say, should I breathe smoke into my body and expect that to be good for me? Certainly not good. And everybody that smokes nowadays says, oh, this is a terrible habit. I know it's killing me. It's not like people actually think that it's good for them. Although there are people that say, like uh, my friend Paul did, I've got to do it for my health sake because if I don't do it, I'm just so depressed and I'm so mentally disturbed and all this stuff. And he was relying on that to get him through to another day. Like now I, I am not, I don't know what that's like. If somebody's on medication and their doctor said, Hey, you got to take this medication. That's the only thing that get you through. Look, I, there are some problems with that. And there's some things that I think uh, are wrong about that. But like, I'm not going to just condemn that person uh, for trying to do what the doctor says to do and trying to do their best. But there's some things that we need to think about and some things that I think that, uh, that would cause some problems in the area of putting God first and saying, well, what does the Bible say? Okay. We say, well, the Bible doesn't say anything about smoking. I agree with you, but there are some things about smoking in general that I believe are harmful. And I want to talk about this, uh, in three points. Okay. Uh, I tried to make them all with the same letter at first by accident, but then I decided to for here we go. Number one. It's harmful to your temple harmful to your temple. Now I say your temple, but actually, you know what the, it, the, the meaning of body being a temple is? What is a temple? What is a, what's a good definition of a temple? Hmm? A, temp, a building for what purpose? It's a house of God, right? A temple will be a house of God. First Corinthians, our text right here, verse Corinthians 6. And look at verse 19 and 20. It says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are, which, uh, are God's. Uh, honor Him in those things which are God's. They belong to God. Your body is the temple of God. It's the house of God. Uh, and so here's one thing I want to point out about this text, though. Okay, that's easy to say, and I heard that my whole life. If people said, well, you show me one verse in the Bible that says I shouldn't smoke, we're all going to go to that verse. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Well, here's the problem. What if you overeat? Hey, man, your body's a temple of the Holy Ghost. What if you, I mean, there's unlimited amount of things that you could say that somebody could do that says, hey, I'm defiling the temple. Okay, but I want to know, I want you to, I want to point out a couple things in this verse that might kind of take you by surprise if you've always heard that verse quoted in that way. And that is the use of the plural word, you, or your, okay? Who's he talking about? Who is the temple? Uh, have you ever heard anybody say, well, we are the church, okay? And the church isn't a building, the church are, the church is our people, okay? And so that they basically say, hey, I'm the temple of God. Uh, you're the temple of God, you're the temple of God, you're the temple of God. And like there's a whole bunch of little temples of God roaming around the earth. And I understand by principle the Holy Ghost dwells with, within me, so therefore I am the temple of the Holy Ghost. But if you really think about what he's saying, he's actually kind of talking about the fact that we assembly, assemble together, right? We're assembling as the church or a synonymous word would be the temple. Now, when I first uh, started going to Iola Baptist Temple, I was like, like so many people are when we knock on their door, and they're like, temple? <laughs> not so many. Every once in a great while. And many people, have, uh, Christians, have asked me, how come it's not Iola Baptist Church? It's Iola Baptist Temple. I used to think, well, that is kind of weird. And so I thought, well, maybe they're just saying temple to, because they're saying, hey, well, the, we're talking about the building, and the building isn't the... Uh, uh, you know, the church isn't the building, the church is the people, so we'll just call the building the temple. But actually, the Bible says there is no temple, we're the temple. And so it's synonymous, we're the house of God, we're the temple. Look at First uh, Timothy 
Uh, let me just read it to you. First Timothy 3.15 says, But if I, we'll read this passage in a, in a minute. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. Look, if you're in Christ, you're part of the temple. You, you are part of the church. You are part of uh, God's people. Now, obviously, it's not a universal where just everybody in the world is part of this universal church. No, when you assemble together with other believers, you're a church. You're a gathering. You're an assembly uh, of people. And God, and God said, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of you, right? There's this idea about this presence uh, for those believers who assemble together. And so we're the church. And so... Uh, this idea of the temple, look, you're not just, it's not just about, it, it's true, there's an application being made there because the context is talking about fornication and all this kind of stuff. And uh, you could say, well, look, you're destroying your body and your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost and you're supposed to serve God with your body and all that. I understand that, but it goes way beyond that. You know, if a person is constantly smoking and he's harming his body, when you harm your body, you're harming the whole, the whole uh, group. Right, you're all of God. God is the one who should be in charge. It says you're not your own. You're bought with the price. You know, look, that doesn't mean we're not we're not going to go to heaven if we uh, if we live for ourselves. Look, we all fall into those sins. We all fall into times where we're living for ourselves and not for God. It's not a salvation issue, but it's saying, hey, if you are part of God's body, the house of God. You know, why would you do these things? And it lists all kinds of things, you know, uh, fornication and, and, uh, and, and all, all those kinds of things. So uh, harmful to your temple. We can understand that. Also, this is where I had to stretch it, okay? Harmful to your tykes. <laughs> that means children, all right? But it starts with a T. Don't judge me. <laughs> okay. Harmful for your children or your tykes. To me... This is my biggest reason why people ought not smoke. It really is. Because I know that smoking affects other people. You know, look, I'm going to just be straight with you. If I ride in the car and I don't wear my seatbelt, that might be against the law, but who am I hurting? I'm not hurting you by not wearing my seatbelt, okay? <laughs> Everybody <be> quiet. <laughs> but there are some things that when we do, we hurt other people. And look, this is from the CDC. I don't quote the CDC very often, okay? I pick and choose what I want to believe. Of what they say. No, I'm just kidding. This is from the CDC. It says, there is no risk-free level of secondhand smoke exposure. Even brief exposure can be harmful to health. Since 1964, approximately 2,500,000 2, smokers have died from health problems caused by exposure to secondhand smoke. <clears throat> Uh, health, uh, health effects in children. In children, secondhand smoke causes the following. Ear infections, more frequent and severe asthma attacks, respiratory symptoms, for example, coughing, sneezing, and shortness of breath, respiratory infections, bronchitis and pneumonia, a greater risk of sudden infant death syndrome. And look, we live in a world where people are sick all the time all the time. So what's the answer? They go to the doctors. Hey, I got a cold here. Take this medicine. Take these drugs. Take this. Hey, you got problems with asthma. Hey, inhale this. Right. And they, and they're all constantly treating all these symptoms. But you know, a lot of those sicknesses are caused by the fact that they're, they're around secondhand smoke all the time. And every time they're around mom and dad, cigarettes coming out of hand and they're breathing smoke in their face and they're living in this environment where the filth is on the walls. You don't think that the kids are breathing that in? That, that is a real big problem for me. When I go to a restaurant and I see like there's two people sitting at the table and they've got a little kid there and two people are drinking alcohol, I'm like, who's driving? Who's driving? That kid is in harm. And that really bothers me, right? But the same is true. People that live around smoke all the time, uh, that's causing secondhand uh, uh, smoke and it's, and it's bad for them. And even the CDC, <laughs> CDC points this out and this is why it's brought to the attention and it's written on the back of all these kinds of things because smoking doesn't just affect you but everybody who's breathing that in and that's why they you know other than the uh, besides the fact that it's it ruins uh 
uh, you know, it ruins furniture and it, and it has, you got to repaint the walls and it stinks. And so it's bad for business. Uh, that's one of the reasons a lot of businesses stopped allowing smoking, but not just that, the fact that, Hey, it's not right for me to come into this place of business and, uh, and have to endure breathing in the smoke of all these people. Look, sometimes you can't avo avoid it. And so like, I'm not saying go protest your place of employment because everybody's smoking. <laughs> that's a, that's a, uh, risk that you might have to take, but the, but look, as far as innocent children are involved, if you're a smoker and you got, and your children are around it, you need to stop. You need to stop because you're destroying your children. And here's what Luke 17, two says, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and cast into the sea than he should offend one of these little ones. Like, I think that can apply to a lot of things, you know, and they should never, uh, you should never harm a child. Bible says in Psalm 127, verse uh, 3, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. Look, the Lord has rewarded you with a child, and He's given you this heritage, and you're going to destroy this child's life and um, cause them to have lung problems and sicknesses and, and possibly cancer and possibly die from... Uh, uh, from secondhand smoke, that's terrible. We put childproof, uh, you know, locks on our cabinet doors to keep them out of poison. And, uh, and we put gates on the stairs so they don't fall down. We do all these things. We lock up these, uh, bad things, harmful things, but then give them cancer and asthma and lung disease and all that by breathing. I, I say we, I don't, but, but there are people out there that do. And so it's not only harmful for your temple, it's harmful. And, you know, again, you could make the analogy that we are all the temple and it's harmful to the body of Christ, but also it's harmful to your children or your tykes. And then it's also harmful for this, your testimony. It's, it's a shame that when I started talking about smoking, the first thing I thought of was Paul Fink, my friend who I hate the fact I, I, I'm, t I'm tore up that he passed away in such a lonely situation. And so, and, and, and not seen, uh, by that many people, and he kept talking about coming back to church sometime, but he didn't. Look, he's a man. I believe that. I believe he loved the Lord. He wanted to be in the ministry. But you know why uh, he wasn't in the ministry? Well, there's lots of reasons, but when he came to Iola, after he had been in the ministry for a while, and then it failed, and he had a, uh, um, uh, problems with his marriage and stuff like that, and then he, he had a long time uh, where uh, life was just not good for him depressed, had the PTSD, all those kinds of things, was still smoking. At one point got into drinking and stuff, but I guess he quit that. Came back to church, got his life right, and he said, I want to be in the ministry. What do I have to do uh, to get, this is when Brother Collins was was a pastor, and he got to Brother Collins and said, what do I have to do to be able to get you approved and, and help me to uh, start this ministry? And Brother Collins said, well, one thing, start with you quit smoking. Now, you know, there are some people that, how dare him stop a guy from being in the ministry because he smokes? Look, is there anything in the Bible that says if you smoke, you can't? No. In fact, you know what? I don't care if you smoke, go preach the gospel. right? I don't care if you smoke, go to church, be involved however you can, right? do all these kinds of things. The point was that this guy had demonstrated clearly that he couldn't get control of an area in his life because it because this, this, this uh, whatever the the case, you know, with his nightmares or or in life or whatever the case was, his only dependency was on the smoking. And he admitted that. He made it very clear. And so he's saying, look, before you can think about going into the ministry, let's get this out of your life. And eventually he decided, because at first he was like, pray for me, pray for me. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. And then eventually he said, I can't do it. And what he ended up doing was just dropping out of church. And every time he called me, we'd have a good conversation. I encouraged him and tried to get him to come back to church and, 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 and serve the Lord. And I said, hey, you can go with me to preach the gospel or whatever, because he kept saying, hey, God called me to do work. God called me to do work. He called me to do work. And, I, and, and he was mad at, at Brother Collins because he said, no, as long as you're doing that, uh, you know, I'm not going to put you in charge of any kind of ministry or anything like that because you're demonstrating that you have this thing in your life that you cannot get rid of. Like he never said that that means he's not saved or something like that. He's just saying like this is you need to get control of that before you can move to the next step. And so instead of working on that and getting that out of his life, what he ended up doing was just living alone and saying, hey, forget that. And he didn't go to church. And uh, 
and you had all kind of problems, and I hate that, I hate that. But the thing is, I associate in my mind, when I think about smoking, it always, psh, Paul Fink. And it's not just because of the fact that I know he was struggling with that and he couldn't stop. It was the fact that that kind of defined him. When he walked in a room, you smell and you knew that he is a smoker. And you knew that he was talking about the fact that his, he, he had PTSD and the doctor said, hey, the smoking will help. You know, <laughs> all these kinds of things. And the thing is that whether he likes it or not, it affected his testimony. Everybody around knew that he had a dependency on this thing. You know, look, it's, look, there are worse things out there that a person could do than smoke. I understand that. Uh, there are worse sins. But this did affect his testimony. It looked bad, and everybody saw that. And even though the psychiatrist said, hey, this is good for you, go ahead and do it, uh, he needed to trust the Lord, and he needed to get by however he could. Now, look, again, if a doctor tells you to take some kind of drugs and you take those drugs, I'm not going to, you know, get in the way of that or try to start uh, something because, uh, but I'm going to tell you this, a lot of the drugs that the that the, psychi the, the doctors prescribe are just, just as bad or worse than some of the illegal drugs that people get on the streets that we preach about all the time. Yeah. And so the idea about being dependent on a drug... That's dangerous. Now, I don't know the science behind it. Some people have mental problems and stuff like that. I get it. And I'm not going to stop somebody from doing that, except this. I know that that causes a bad testimony. I know that there's reasons why you can't represent the church if you're addicted to this kind of thing. We can't put you in some kind of a ministry. If everybody knows, hey, that person's got an addiction to, uh, to this substance or something like that, it does affect your testimony. Look at 1 Timothy 3. Now, this is specifically to pastors and to deacons, but there's no doubt about it. Uh, the reason this has to be the standard or the qualification for pastors and deacons is because they're supposed to be setting the example, right? Well, all of us should be trying to live up to that kind of a, of a, of a standard, okay, because it's not important who it is. A pastor is not better than anybody else just because he's a pastor. He's just said, he, he, they, let's put this guy in charge because he's met these qualifications and somebody put their hands on him and said, hey, this is the man for the work. Go do it. All right. And so this is all, that's all that it, it entails. It doesn't mean he's better than anybody else. But here's what it says. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, right? Now, uh, we think about alcohol, sober, but sobriety could uh, involve a lot of things. If a person just can't think because of a certain substance that's affecting their mind or whatever, uh, and don't th throw coffee my way, that doesn't affect my thing. <laughs> just kidding. Of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, not, uh, uh, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man not, uh, uh, know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, uh, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in pure conscience, and let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderous, sober, uh, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree, and uh, great boldness in the faith which is in, uh, in Christ Jesus. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto you shortly. But if I tarry long, recognize this verse, that thou mayest know how to, thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar in the ground of truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on the world received up to glory. So look, the purpose of the church, no doubt, preach the gospel uh, and to message. That's, that's it. That's why we're here. So everything we do as far as, hey, making sure people are living right, making sure people aren't doing certain things, putting only certain people in charge, not other people, it's all so that the whole purpose of the church can be, uh, you know, uh, it can be 
done without hindrance. Okay, and so the idea there is uh, to keep the church clean and to uh, and to preach the word. And, 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 and in order to do that, there are certain qualifications that have to be met. <clears throat> it is important that the world sees our good works. I didn't say that's a, that that if if you don't do all the things right and live perfectly that you're not saved. I didn't say that. You know you you know that that's not a matter of our salvation. But here's what the Bible says, Matthew 5:16, "Let your light show so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven." Our desire should be that the world sees Christ through us. And and, and all the other problems of this world and the things that might have to affections and all that kind of stuff, we've got to find a way to get those things. Look, we live in the... We're going to have things that hold us up, but we need to let certain things go. And certainly uh, everybody that I know that's had a problem with smoking knows it's bad for them, knows it's killing them, knows it's affecting those around them, knows that it looks bad, and yet they cannot get control of that. And so I would... Uh, admonish anybody who's struggling with that to try uh, to figure out a way to get that under control and to uh, get that out of their life so that they can be better used of Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And, uh, and I know it's easy to look at an area uh, of addiction that I've never dealt with and, and maybe this room never dealt with and to kind of uh, use that as an as an object to lift ourselves up and think that we're better than somebody else. But we know we all have addictions. We all have things that could cause us to have a bad testimony. We all have things that would hinder us from doing your work. And Lord, so I'm praying that you help us uh, to understand the uh, the heart behind this message, and and that we would uh, r recognize that we're the temple of the Holy Ghost, and uh, we're the house of God. And we need to try to live right as such and as your people uh, to be a light into this world that they might see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Lord, I pray you be glorified now in Jesus' name. Amen.